Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's, it's time, time for, for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom. We have Biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 Welcome to Boom. I'm Hannah. And I'm Melissa. And today we have a really exciting interview for you. We talked to professors Adrian Beganza Topole and Manuel Rausch. Adrian is a professor at Purdue University and Manuel is at UT Austin. And what's cool is they both collaborate together on a project that utilizes both modeling techniques and uh, biomechanical experimental techniques mm-hmm. to study skin biomechanics. And skin biomechanics is something we have yet to talk about on Boom. So it's a really exciting interview and you'll learn a lot, I guarantee you. Yeah, I learned a lot and I also laughed a lot. It was really <laughs> fun. Um, they have such a fun dynamic. So it was great to have that show through in the interview and uh, yeah, just in- have a great, uh, enjoyable conversation too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but before we get on to our interview, yes, let's do a bit of boom. A bit of boom. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. Lily. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. Great. Well, so today in the interview, you'll hear a lot about skin biomechanics, and it'll become apparent that technology for a quick in vivo assessment of soft tissue biomechanics in general would be really useful for biological research and clinical diagnostics in, so th- for things like tracking condition or tracking responses to treatment, evaluating deteriorations for dermatological conditions that are meaningful, but sometimes the change is, is small and difficult to detect. For skin tracking wound healing, tissue growth, aging, and also guiding objective assessments of disease severity such as edema. So there's a ton of applications and, you know, motivation for studying skin biomechanics. One important evaluation of skin is the elastic modulus, so this relationship between strain and stress in the skin. Hmm. And so the paper I wanted to talk about um, was a paper that was published in 2021 in Nature Biomedical Engineering by Song and colleagues, and they present a simple miniature electromechanical system that can interface with biological tissues for precise rapid evaluations. Whoa. So basically they developed this device. It takes about a minute for an individual measurement and it's the size of a fingertip and it's placed on the outside of a person's skin. On your finger. Well, it's the size of your fingertip. Um, oh. You could place it on your finger if you wanted to look at the skin on your finger. But, uh, you can place you it on can, any skin. You can place it on any skin that you would like <laughs> to uh, look at. And it each sensor integrates a vibratory actuator and a soft strain sensing sheet. So Whoa. you can dynamically measure Young's modulus of skin and other soft tissues at depths uh, between 1 and 8 millimeters. Hold up. It doesn't go into your skin, though, right? Correct. It okay. does not go into your skin. Wow. But it's somehow skin. able to, like, Have make measurements depth, of yeah. that depth. Yeah, exactly. And you can uh, also use arrays of them to spatially map elastic moduli and profile the modulus depth-wise. So hmm. it's cool to think about how you might use multiple of these. And they experimentally and computationally establish the operating principles of the device. And they also evaluated the performance with synthetic and biological materials and with human skin and healthy volunteers. So, And as one application, they actually evaluated the device with psoriasis. So psoriasis is a skin disease that is, causes red, itchy, scaly patches commonly on the knees elbows trunk and scalp and it's a it's a really common a chronic disease and it, it doesn't have any cure mm-hmm. currently so they were able to show that the device could actually accurately locate psoriasis lesions wow that's it's huge to have these types of devices it's i feel like mm-hmm. there's a reason dermatologists get paid so much right that's sort of still a very human like you know, you sort of need a human to diagnose and understand all yes. of these complexities. But yeah. like, it sounds like having tools like these could really help advance some yeah. of the diagnostics. Yeah, and, and we talked about treatments. like edema and like swelling of skin, and a lot of these things are pretty subjective right now. Right. So it's you know, you're going in and, and you're just 
you know, what you can see visually, but having some right. more quantitative measures will be really helpful. And I really like this study because not only did they develop this device, but they tested it in a variety of conditions and the results did support this use of this compact electronic device for, for rapid and precise mechanical characterization of living tissues. And so they can use this, it can hopefully be used in the future to monitor and diagnose a range of Mm -hmm. health disorders um and as we we actually talk a little bit about movement Mm -hmm. and skin and this is also just making me think (laughs) about how skin stretch is related to things going on inside of the body too so maybe we cannot just monitor you know diseases that are affecting the skin but is there a way to you know measure things that are going on outside of the body that can be related to what's going on inside i always think that's a really cool you know sort Mm -hmm. of thinking about that so yeah we'll learn more about in the interview, more about skin biomechanics and why it's important, but always keeping biomechanics and, and human movement in the back of our minds, I think. For sure. Right, actually, at the front, right on our minds. Right on our minds. <laughs> well, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for sharing that. It'd be cool to see if Manuel and Adrian had any thoughts on this device. Maybe they can do future studies. Yeah. All right, let's cool. get on to the interview. Let's do it. Welcome to Boom. We are here with professors Adrian Buganza Tapole and Manuel Rausch. Adrian is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering at Purdue University. And Manuel is an assistant professor at of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at and biomedical engineering at UT Austin. So thank you so much for being here to talk with us today. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, Adrian, would you share when you first knew you wanted to be a biomechanist? Yeah, I'm not sure I remember exactly, but it was definitely during college. So I was studying mechanical engineering and very interested in robotics and sort of dynamic analysis of, of robots. I was doing this sort of independent study. And then my brother, who's a little bit older than me, he was studying medicine and wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And somehow, I don't remember the specifics, but I ended up running into Scott Delp's papers on some of oh, the, wow. the as these independent just study. casually browsing yeah. the literature one day <laughs> one was on the floor and you stepped on it <laughs> I, I was doing sort of like a research uh, not really doing research but sort of reading uh trying to get my feet wet on, on research and then i found that because yeah as i said because my brother was studying for to be an orthopedic surgeon and i just found it fascinating hmm. and yep i think that that was it I do completely different stuff now, but I think that was uh, sort of how I got into it. The beginning. How about you, Manuel? When did you first know you wanted to be a biomechanist? You know, about the age of five years old, I woke up. (laughs) Um, I I started uh, actually as an automotive engineer because I'm from Germany and, you know, that's (laughs) that's what what you do there. (laughs) What else, right? So I wanted to work for Mercedes. Um, Things have obviously turned out a little differently, but... I started automotive engineering and didn't find that very interesting and then got curious about material science and through material science learned about biomaterials and then learned about the total artificial heart and thought that was the coolest thing ever, right? To combine engineering with medicine, with biology and save people. And then became an exchange student and went to University of Utah, which is kind of like the home for artificial heart research. And so the first artificial heart was developed at University of Utah. Anyways, I went there applied for an internship program with that um, company and and they weren't interested. And I was like, I don't know what else to do. And I was taking a biomechanics class at the time with uh, Jeff Weiss, who you may know as as a soft tissue biomechanician and worked in his lab as an undergraduate student and um, fell in love with soft tissue biomechanics. And specifically, I did finite element analyses at the time. And then as I was applying to grad school, I was looking at people that did cardiovascular soft tissue biomechanics using numerical methods and ran into the profile of Ellen Cools, and she was an alma mater, so I got in touch with someone I knew at my home institution, and the end is, uh, I guess, history. Uh, I did a PhD in soft tissue biomechanics related to um, the heart and used the finite element method for it, So, um, and then things developed since. That's fantastic. It's funny. We were just talking with John McPhee recently about the overlap between control or optimization algorithms and control and, and the automotive field, especially in terms of autonomous vehicles, and then like human movement control. So it's kind of funny here to also see this overlap between your automotive studies and material uh, sciences and material engineering, and then moving that, applying that to the body as well. Yeah, I think, you know, biomechanics is a relatively young field in comparison to other forms of engineering. And so I think a lot of the methods and, and 
uh, tools are sort of reminiscent of those from other fields because I think many of them were lent from there. So I think there's sort of a you know underlying mechanism for that, I would assume. Yeah, definitely. Can you now, so I'm sure a lot has happened between then and now, but could you just give us more of a brief update on, on what's going on now? What are you uh, working on? And uh, maybe also just an, an overview of why you're both on here together and, and what you've been collaborating on. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll start a little bit with the, with the story. So after, and I'll continue where, where I uh, stopped before that I got interested because of Scott Delp's work. And then I actually went to Stanford, but I took Ellen's class when mm, I when I first Ellen joined. Cool, yeah. And yeah, Ellen Cool soft tissue and growth class. And um, Scott Dell was on sabbatical that year that mm. I, that I when I started. And so I was just taking biomechanics class. I couldn't take his class that first year. And then I just got really into the soft tissue mechanics portion. And that's why I don't do sort of human motion biomechanics. Oh, I do more it's of so the, funny it's how that happens. It's all about timing. Yeah. yeah. More of the soft tissue. You know, the, the funny part he leaves out was that I was his TA, so I taught him everything. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But he, he tends to leave that out, you know? <laughs> well, depending on how much he knows, he may want to leave it out or... <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I was getting there, Manu. And, but yeah, that's where I met Manu, because we both did our PhD with Ellen Cool. That's awesome. It's fun to, to see that and see those... I think the community, the biomechanics mm-hmm. community is so strong and it, it always, it can start off with these ties, you know, even before becoming a professor. And, and it's just funny how these connections kind of stay, uh, stay with you throughout your career. In fact, Melissa and I actually first met working on a project in mm-hmm. Scott Delp's class. So it was pretty cool. Pretty cool how that works out. <laughs> the ironic part now is that Adrian has to teach me, as a <laughs> you know, I guess the student became the, the teacher. <laughs> even better. <laughs> And what are you working on now together, Manuel? You want to take that? Sure. I don't know how honest I can be here, but um, <laughs> when, I, when I started my, my assistant professor position, I was sitting at my desk and I realized that I had no idea what I was doing and what I was going to do. And Adrian had started before me. And so I, I guess I just sort of co-tailed. And I was like, Adrian, what, what can I do with you where we can bring in money and I have something to do? <laughs> and so we, we kind of sat down and, and tried to be very strategic about how we could collaborate and try to identify a problem that was very clinically relevant. And, and pressure ulcers, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, turned out to be a huge clinical problem. And so Adrian was doing skin mechanics and has always done skin mechanics. So he's really the expert on this team of two. I'm the muscle, he's the expert, I would argue. Maybe we're both the muscle, <laughs> he's the expert. But um, then we sat down and we said, okay, this is a problem. How can we combine our interests and our expertise uh, to try to address that? And, and then... We wrote, I think, my first grant together. Adrian at the time um, was ahead of me and, and was able to share a lot of his expertise with me on how to do that. And um, yeah, we wrote this grant together and it got funded, which is really wild. To me. Um, <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, we, we at the time just didn't know very much about it. But here we are. So this is how we ended up working together on this project. And uh, I think this is now three or four years ago. And um, yeah. Well, we haven't really talked much about skin biomechanics on Boom before, so we'd love it if you could give us a little bit more detail about sort of what that is and and maybe why you found it um, interesting to study. You said you didn't really know much about it, and then you wrote a grant, you got some money, and (laughs) now you're in it. So... I want to be very clear. I didn't know much about it. Adrian is an expert on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to let Adrian take the lead on this one. Yeah, Adrian's like, on this, please. Adrian is like, wait a second. This is what I do for a living, dude. I think we're, yeah, we're both experts, but I have been, Manu has contributed a different aspect, uh, more on the characterization, the experimental characterization, and I've been doing more on the modeling. But it's true that during my PhD, I basically worked on skin. So that was my my PhD project, and I got interested in it actually through the class projects, through the Ellen Cool's class on mechanics of growth. I really stepped on this on this uh, application of uh, tissue expansion, which has to do with how you can grow skin to to resurface defects. And actually, that that's just how my whole PhD started because I did that as a class project, and then it just sort of became my PhD thesis. And yeah, so I've been working on skin for for a long time. And I find it fascinating because it's uh, the largest organ on our body, if you uh, measure in terms of uh, the weight and surface area. And it's very thin 
only a couple of millimeters thick, but it has a very well uh, and complex microstructure. So it has three layers. It has an epidermis layer at the top, which is an epithelial tissue, so it's mostly cellular. It has a dermis layer in the middle, which that one is the load bearing component, and that one is made out of collagen and elastin. And that's the, the layer that actually gives the skin its mechanical properties. And then there's a hypodermis layer below, which is a fatty tissue that connects the skin with the underlying muscle. Yeah, so the mechanics are, are just fascinating because it's very nonlinear and anisotropic. So it's very soft in the small deformation regime, but then it becomes very stiff if you, if you stretch it. And that's functionally good because that's what allows you to sort of move and interact with things. Uh, but at the same time, it protects you from, you know, physical harm. And yeah, it's also an isotropic, which also has some functional implications. So you want to, the skin to deform more in one direction with respect to, to another. Hopefully that, that gives some, yeah. some sort of overview of the, <laughs> of the organ. No, that's, yeah, that's so interesting. And it, it's, as we're thinking about human movement, it's also kind of interesting to think about skin biomechanics and how those are kind of interplaying together if the biomechanics of our skin affect our movement mm-hmm. in some way um, and maybe in the, in the opposite as well. Well, I think of yeah. our open sim models that don't have skin. They don't have skin, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was just thinking about. It's always creepy to see. It's like, y'all, this is not how a person looks like. <laughs> Something's missing. I can't put my this. finger yeah. on it. <laughs> Super creepy. Especially the animal ones. Those without yeah. skin are, yeah, terrifying. I mean, look at our friend back here. He looks kind of weird. <laughs> Yeah, it's not right. It's not not right. right. (laughs) I'm curious. So you talked about how your project now is focusing on pressure ulcers and um, sort of the mechanics of that. Could you talk about why pressure ulcers are such an important problem? And what is a pressure ulcer? This is addressed to Adrian or me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Manuel, feel free. Yeah, yeah. Either one of you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess explaining what's going on with those and then why, yeah, it's such a, there's such a need to, to solve these or this challenge. Yeah. So it's quite interesting if you talk to um, medical personnel, especially nurses, um, what kind of day-to-day issues to deal with. It's not often what you classically think of the big problems that we need to solve as humanity, right? Of course, you know, cancer and heart disease are enormous problems. I'm not downplaying them. But on a day-to-day basis, nobody thinks about pressure ulcers. And, And those are one of those issues that are being faced every day by patients as well as clinical staff and, and clinical personnel. And so what pressure ulcers essentially are, are wounds, chronic wounds that develop because um, the skin is locally compressed. And as the skin is compressed, the microvascular collapses. And of course, as the microvascular collapses, there's no blood getting to tissue. And that means that cells don't get the nutrients and oxygen that they need to maintain their uh, metabolism. So they in a combination of mechanical damage as well as reperfusion injury and ischemic injury die, and then you have an open wound, and that can become very, very difficult to manage um, clinically. And so why would that happen? Well, skin being compressed happens in all of us. So if you sit in a car, say, and you go on a road trip, um, you may notice that after a while your butt just hurts, right? Or your back just hurts. And what do you do? You reposition yourself. And as you do so, what you essentially do is you unload that tissue locally and you allow it to be perfused again and you have no issue, right? But now imagine you're unconscious, right? So for example, you are in a coma. Now you, of course, cannot reposition yourself and that damage will get to a point where your tissue locally dies and and becomes a pressure ulcer. Or say you don't have any sensation in that part of your Um, tissue because you're quadriplegic, for example, right? Then you also cannot reposition yourself. And we're not talking about weeks and weeks on end. We're talking about just several hours. So even during surgery, when um, somebody is um, under anesthesia and cannot obviously reposition themselves, and it's not desired for someone to reposition themselves, this can be enough time for pressure also to form. And it's a huge financial burden um, to a point where hospitals take extreme measures to avoid them because uh, actually in our medical system, it's come to the point where the hospitals actually carry the uh, liability for pressure ulcers that are acquired within the hospital settings. So hospitals are very uh, motivated to minimize the number of hospital acquired pressure ulcers. Is this commonly referred to as like bed sores? Like I know my mom worked in a nursing home. That's okay. exactly yeah. mm-hmm. okay. That's exactly it. I should have no, said no, that up okay. front. So a lot of people know the term bed sore. And that's essentially what it is. Yeah. And so people in wheelchairs, for example, experience 
pet source as well. So that, in that sense, pet source is not a great right. um, it's not, yeah. <laughs> um, term because it sort of doesn't encompass a lot of scenarios in which you can develop uh, pressure ulcers. But yes, that's what Yeah, it is. that makes sense. And I um, used to work with uh, Professor Brian Davis at the University of Akron, and he was particularly mm-hmm. interested in ulcers in the feet of people with diabetes. So they lose feeling in their feet and also tend to form these pressure ulcers or the, yeah, these, these ulcers. And it was interesting as you were explaining it, I, I think when we hear pressure ulcer, it kind of makes you feel like it's the force of like constantly having pressure to the skin that might be causing this. But as you're explaining that it really is more due to like the pressure causing a reduction in like nutrients and, and blood circulation and these things that the the skin needs to survive. That was um, really helpful to better understand the problem. I'm curious, one, when I hear about this in hospitals, I think the solution is to sort of just keep moving the person around more um, and changing their position. And I'm wondering if there are any other ways that you might be thinking of solutions to this or how you're thinking about that. And also if more people or certain people are more susceptible, like it it just goes, does it go beyond just the actual physical forces that are applied? And are there things about certain people that make them more likely to get pressure ulcers, even if they're like in the same position as another person? Yeah. So there's, there's a few risks. Uh, factors that will be associated with the increased susceptibility of pressure ulcers. And some of them are behavioral, whether or not the the person can change position, for example. And then there's also comorbidities that can affect, like you were mentioning, diabetes, for example, has some dysregulation of your inflammatory system. So it's more easy that if you get a wound, it becomes a chronic wound, as opposed to people that don't have diabetes, the inflammation cascade is, is less pronounced. So it's more easy to control and to prevent it from from developing into a chronic wound. So then there's definitely comorbidities. And the specifically, I think what we want to to isolate with the with the studies that we're doing is how the changes in mechanics of the skin contribute uh, just by the fact that with aging, for example, you have a change in the properties of the tissue, you have a change in the vasculature, and overall that has an effect on how you perfuse your tissues and how much deformation there is when you are sitting, for example. Uh, so out of all the different aspects that, that can affect the, the process, which are which many, in particular, I think what we want to really understand well is the biomechanics aspect uh, of it. Thanks. Yeah, that's really helpful. As I've been thinking about this too, so my work is mostly focused on the osteoarthritis population. And I think with that disease, we think a lot about changes with aging in terms of muscular atrophy. We think about bone bone density changing and even, you know, movement and gait changing, things that are starting to predict other risks like falling. And I'm curious how skin biomechanics might be changing with aging and what kind of effect this might be having on people as well. I'm also, I guess, as you're talking about hospitalizations, thinking about also like children, you know, in the hospital too, are they more or less likely to get this uh, or to have pressure ulcers versus like, you know, an older adult? And then, yes, more senior people, I see, feel like they probably have like the highest risk. I, I, it's a great question. And it's fundamentally, I guess, what we're trying to answer in our work. So if you look at the distribution age distribution of people that do suffer from pressure ulcers, it's very heavily biased toward people of more advanced age, right? And I think what's difficult here is that a lot of those factors are, of course, related to comorbidities and behavioral aspects, right? So you're going to be more likely to be immobile when you're older, right? You're going to be more likely to have diabetes when you're older. So there's a lot of factors that are not necessarily related to mechanics that contribute to higher susceptibility with advanced age. So our question was, well, nobody has really looked at to what extent there's also mechanics-related changes that contribute to the susceptibility, right? Because all of us know from a very practical perspective, when we age, our skin changes. And it changes dramatically, right? And no judgment here whatsoever. But when you look at someone who is older, they're their skin visibly has changed. Right. right? And I, even I, my grandparents, you know, if they fall, like their their skin is so so much thin, there's so much they bruise easier, it tears easier. Like, yeah, you can you can tell that mm-hmm. it's definitely That is exactly it, right? So and this is kind of just 
everybody knows this, but interestingly enough, nobody has looked at how do the changes in the skin mechanics that we all know do occur affect that susceptibility. And that question becomes interesting exactly at that interface between is the pressure also due to the mechanics or do the biological changes? Well, it's not necessarily a chicken egg, but kind of like a chicken egg, right? In that the pressure is applied. That's clearly a mechanical phenomenon. The pressure you know, compresses your vasculature, that's a mechanical phenomenon. But then the ischemia or the lack of oxygen following that event, that's a biological event, right? But now imagine if your skin has a better ability to protect the vasculature from that pressure, right? Um, Then that could be an age-related factor. So imagine your skin is thinner, then, you know, the pressures that are applied are not going to be distributed as well across sort of a larger area and therefore your vasculature experiences more of an acute stress and that is ultimately our hypothesis our hypothesis is your skin becomes thinner your skin changes its properties such that these loads are less dissipated and that itself could lead to a higher susceptibility and so that's ultimately what also the vasculature uh, changes so it has been reported that there's less vasculature so if you have less blood supply in the first place, and it's easier to collapse it with an applied load, then even more likely to develop uh, the ischemia and then the, the ulcer. I see. So with this hypothesis, we're wondering how, how do you test that and what are the methods you're using? Are you, what kind of skin are you using? How do you, how do, you do these types of experiments? Well, I explain a little bit and then I'll, I'll toss it to, to Manu. Because <laughs> we have sort of uh, the reason why we are collaborating in this work is because we, we bring complementary expertise. So I've, I've focused much more on the modeling side of things. Also because we're great friends. And mm. that too. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> At least I think so. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> I think it seems so like much. I just need you for the experiments. <laughs> no, I love it. When apparently. this project's <laughs> done, like, that's it. Stop calling me. I didn't, I didn't think that was the outcome of this interview that I learned my friend isn't actually my friend. Boom gets real. We get down to the business. Oh, boom. Ruined. So we do therapy. Yeah. Ruined. <laughs> hey, man, we charge extra for that. Yeah. <laughs> In addition Sorry. to the friendship. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian. <laughs> I do a little bit more of the modeling and Manu does more of the experimental work. So from from the modeling side of things, we are developing multi-scale models that can couple basically this overall deformation and the overall properties that we can well, that we can measure with biaxial tests to models that can tell us about how changing properties and changing vasculature geometry can lead to different amount of ischemia and so that's how we couple basically the knowledge or the different pieces that we can gather experimentally to try to focus it on how exactly is it that the thinning of the of the dermis would contribute to higher risk of ischemia with a given pressure, for example. I see. So use the modeling to kind of tie together the bio, the mechanical and the biology. And then, yeah. That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> um, not that I wiped ding, my tears ding. out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we postulated that we could use a mouse model to investigate this. And um, actually, Adrian found a paper that had developed a relatively simple methodology to apply pressures to the dorsal skin, so the back of mice, and investigate the effect of pressure on the the skin and the development of pressure ulcers thereof. And that was important to us. And this is, I guess, sort of like a little bit of insight into, you know, grant writing and, and, and designing an experiment that at the time we didn't have experience with this model or with mice models in general. And so to us, it didn't seem realistic to investigate a complex model. So previous models had actually implanted sort of metal discs under the dorsal skin and then applied magnets that would compress the skin in between. But of course, that, you know, requires surgical skills, that requires aseptic technique, that requires all kinds of 
things that at the time we didn't have preliminary data for. So this particular methodology, you just take a skin fold and you put two magnets from opposing side around that skin fold and you can sort of like mimic this with your own arm, right? Just imagine you take sort of a fold of your skin. Like pinching, and, you know, when yeah. you're younger, that's a little harder than it is for us at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and so you basically pinch the skin between these two magnets. And that's somebody any that's something anybody can do, right? And so this is the tool we use. And then we made it more sophisticated because we were interested in all the things that were happening at the same time, right? So we said it's not just the pressure and the um, subsequent uh, ischemia. It may actually also be the mechanical damage at the time, right? You can imagine, you can mechanically damage a tissue, right? So we actually um, had the idea that we put a hole in that magnet, so basically have a donut shape, so that some of the tissue was actually exposed to the ischemia, but not the pressure, right? So you imagine in the donut hole, um, you, you get wouldn't a loss get of, blood right. because the vasculature, er- exactly the vasculature around it would collapse, but inside it was mechanically damaged. So we, we made the methodology a little more complex and we involved some imaging modalities to also look at the actual vasculature and try to identify the point at which it collapses. But ultimately we're looking at mice, we induce pressure ulcers by different uh, sort of pressure ulcer formation strategies. So you can actually apply pressure and remove pressure, apply pressure and then remove it again. And so that actually increases the contribution of what's called reperfusion injury to pressure ulcer formation um, versus just leaving it continuously on. And so uh, this is sort of our methodology. And then we're going, you know, in a lot of detail, of course, about it. But ultimately, that's that's what we use. And then we explant the skin, uh, test it mechanically, and then also do biochemical uh, assays to, to identify cell populations and inflammatory markers that we can then use to, A, of course, understand the process from an experimental perspective, but then also feedback into Adrian's mm. models. Yeah, I think that's such an important point and so why this seems like such a great collaboration when you have both the modeling and experimental together and you're you're constantly, you know, informing the experimental with with modeling and mm-hmm. exploring, ex- informing modeling with your experimental work. Like it's a, such a great combination and I am curious in terms of your collaboration and and friendship or, you know, lack <laughs> lack thereof or friendship. <laughs> What do you feel like has helped, I guess, less in like uh, talking about the scientific part, but more in like the people part of like, what has helped you have such a great collaboration so far? And do you have any potential or like tips or potential pitfalls to avoid for a successful collaboration? I think I've lost all my credibility now for the friendship (laughs) argument. Adrian, you can redeem yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think that's it. Yes, uh, we, we have stayed in touch from the from the PhD, even when we were not faculty. So even when, well, Manu was in, in industry for a while, for example, uh, we moved. We were both close enough, I guess. I was in Boston and he was in Connecticut. So, yeah, we kept we kept in touch. There, there is some some true friendship and I think that has definitely helped to yeah to just keep uh, working together and yeah in a, in a way it is true that the project is sort of an excuse to work together I mean I obviously concur I think what's hard is the two of us actually found that it was very helpful to be physically in the same space to do like pretty critical work. And this is not a popular topic during COVID, of course, but I remember this project and our ideas had been dragging out for a while and it really needed us to like visit each other and sit down and really sort of like share that physical space and put our heads together and, you know, be able to go back and forth and write things on, on boards to, to come up with sort of the final idea and have a cohesive grand idea. And I, I often think back to that, that when I'm on Zoom now and I work with collaborators that I wonder would it not be helpful if we were in the same space right now and really were able to like go to dinner together and you know like you know we actually saw a movie i don't remember what it was uh, at the time and and, and i remember walking out of the movie theater and being like oh you know that's a great idea we should do this and that and we had the opportunity to discuss it right there and so i think despite us you know being fairly far away and this going well as a collaboration uh, i remember the initial spark or maybe not the initial spark but sort of what we needed to get it done and it in the beginning, the, the grand writing and the sort of conclusion of the idea really required us to be together. So I think both is important. I think that the staying in touch and the, the ability to communicate through the distance. But I think Adrian came here to visit me. I flew out to Purdue to visit. 
So I think that's also important and cannot be underestimated. And I wonder how much damage that has done over the last year, year and a half. Not to our friendship, of course, because that's solid, as we could all tell. Yeah, yeah, it's very evident from this interview. <laughs> Adrian, were you going to say something? It's completely true. Actually, we got the, the outline of the proposal. I was there for maybe two or two days, maybe two or three days. And then Manu was here as well for a couple of days. And we had dragged our feet maybe for six months without really like rewriting yeah. the outline. And then, yeah, in the span of a couple of days and not even working on it the whole time. So we were really just went hiking, go out for dinner, went, went to movies, but just, yeah, being in the in the same Space for a couple of days. We got the outline done, and then really writing the proposal after that was easy. It was really just that those first couple of pages and uh, sort of the overall design of the of the experiments and the and the modeling. So yeah, completely agree with with Mano. I love this. Like I love you, both of your answers to this question because it highlights like how human like science is, you know, and like you said, we weren't even working the whole time. It was just a matter of being together and being present and like kind of having fun because that's at the ultimately when you shared your stories about how you sort of got into biomechanics, like there was this element of curiosity and fun, I think, in both of your stories. So, yeah, with that being said, kids, get out, have some fun. (laughs) (laughs) Now that is some good advice. This is my public service like, announcement. Pause for the day. this episode <laughs> and go for a walk. Or keep what playing you, the episode. What are you doing <laughs> listening to my podcast anyway? Go for a walk, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Melissa and I definitely feel the like this is actually our first episode in a while that we've done like actually together in the same space. So yeah. um like full episode. So mm-hmm. I, we definitely really makes it a lot. Well, congratulations! <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's a big day. It's a big day. It's a big day. <laughs> so you, you talked about a lot of tips for successful collaboration. Now we're wondering on the flip side. We like to talk about failure on Boom, and we were wondering if you want to share. Either you can share a time you collaboratively failed, maybe in research or separately failed. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Collaboratively, that is. <laughs> I have failed a lot. <laughs> but yeah, if there's an experience you'd like to share, that would be great. I have many failures to share. I really appreciate you all having highlighted that in sort of the, the question catalog that you sent along. I do share that with people all the time. There is this idea that science works. You have a hypothesis, you go in the lab, you test it, it works out, you write a paper, and you change the world. And I have never been part of anything in science that actually worked that way. And I think nobody would ever argue that it does, right? What you see often is the end product, right? What you see is somebody sort of doing revisionist history and not in a, you know, ill-intentioned way, but in a sort of, you know, practical way. Nobody wants to hear about all your failures so that you eventually tell them what worked, right? This is not how you want to read papers. And, And so... But I think that's important to keep in mind that often, you know, ideas have started out completely differently. And along the way, you realized the tool you proposed didn't actually work, right? The model you thought would work was inappropriate. And, you know, the hypothesis was wrong to begin with. And then you you do something else and you formulate a hypothesis and that one works. And then you write a paper about it and it looks like this was all intended. So on a daily basis, you know, I tell my students to try an idea and it doesn't work. My students you know, try something themselves, bring it to me and I poke a hole at it and it doesn't work. And it's such a fundamental aspect of science and research to fail continuously. And I think it's critical for all of us, especially aspiring scientists to understand that nobody expects from you that things work from the beginning, that failing and learning from your failures and trying again and believing in the process is what ultimately leads to success. And that failure is success, right? There is this bias that we don't really acknowledge that testing hypothesis and failing at it is knowledge gain if your hypothesis is well formulated. And so I think, you know, there's many practical examples in which I failed. But um, I think broadly speaking, I think science is, is sort of repeated failure from which we learn. I think the other aspect, not necessarily on the science itself, but also this quest for money to fund your research that's also full of uh, failure i think for yeah either because the design is not correct or just you know there's a finite number of proposals that get funded and so you know maybe it's a good idea 
maybe it's a bad idea, but then maybe it's a good idea, but it just needs a little bit of polishing or it just, you know, you just need to keep on trying. And then you didn't get it the first time, you improve. And then, you know, eventually, hopefully things work out for the, for the best. So that's another one that I think you just cannot uh, give up, can I keep on trying for the, and it's, yeah, I guess it's a little bit, it's related to the science, but has other components to it. I guess, how do you Yeah, and I think idea? that's definitely good to keep perspective on too. Like it might not be your project that you're proposing necessarily, but you know, there's such a, like you mentioned, there's a number of other factors too, to, to keep in mind. So that's really great advice from both of you. So thank you for sharing that. I feel like I'm feeling more inspired to persevere. <laughs> <laughs> Before we last ask our, our last question, how can people learn more about you and your work? You've shared a lot of really interesting ideas about skin biomechanics. I feel like people will be ex- inspired to want to learn more. And if you have, yeah, social media or websites or what's the best way for people? I'm on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter. It's at Manuel K. Rausch 1. And as of now, Adrian is my biggest fan. <laughs> um, so we if are you're... friends. We are friends. I love all your tweets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so this is, this is a sign of friendship. friendship. We also, um, we were talking about yeah, yeah. how we did internet stalking before this, and we saw in your profile on Twitter, it says, like, author of one viral tweet, and I'm curious, yes, yes, I don't know if that's yes. appropriate to share, like, what was, what's, like, what's up with that, with that viral tweet? Yeah, I, I hope that Are if you I an put influencer? it on Twitter, it's appropriate to share. <laughs> <laughs> I influence Adrian, Apparently. I think, to some extent. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I motivate y'all to, to find out what my one viral tweet is. It's um, it's heavily biomechanics related, and it will teach you lots about biomechanics. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, but, you have um, to dig. You have to go find yes, it. You I was like, oh, dig, I'm sure you know, we'll be that, pinned to the top of it so people can find it easily. But no, you're like, you should go through no, all no, 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 of no. My... How many years back do we have to go? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I would say, like, two months ago. Adrian, oh, okay. do, you remember, okay. do you remember my one viral tweet? Yeah, a couple tweet? of months ago. Of course. I wouldn't shut up about it, so everybody in my world knows about it. <laughs> okay, so like around May, we're trying to give like yeah. a time frame for people who are going to be digging. All right, thank you. May 2021, yes, take a look. All I'm saying is it's got over 4,000 likes. So wow. It's, it's, it's a big wow. one. Okay, yes, well, hopefully yes, all yes, your yes, followers will. Well. I want to show <laughs> off. Right? Yeah. Cool, well, thanks. So Twitter but yeah, and... also check out my, yeah, and my website, www.manualrausch.com. Okay, awesome. Thanks. So what about you, Adrian? Uh, Twitter, let me see if I remember my Twitter handle. <laughs> oh, we couldn't find you on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> oh, I'm A Buganza T. So A B U G A N Z A T. Yeah, just follow me and then follow <laughs> and then whoever the one person is who likes my yeah. tweets. <laughs> Perfect. And what about a lab website or? It's the Poly Lab, but it's in it's part of a Purdue domain. Okay, so. awesome. Well, we can yeah, I think we'll we link found them it too. In, we can uh, add the link to that yep, in the episode Lab. description. Perfect. Yeah. And then please let us know whose website is nicer. Obviously, yes, because it's everything's maybe a French, a competition. But it's also a competition. Yeah, yeah. It's- <laughs> yes, yes. It's academia after all, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'll, yeah, like Hannah said, we'll add the links to all of those um, in the episode description. But for our last question, we just want to know what you're most excited about for the future of skin biomechanics. Whoa, that's a nerdy yeah, question. Yeah, we all, what, we like what, to end what, with what our nerdiest question. Yes, excitement. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Haven't all of these been nerdy yeah. questions? <laughs> Well, no, 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 no. You got the spectrum all wrong. This was the cool kid stuff. Okay? Um, I think what excites me about skin mechanics is what excites me about, or the future of skin mechanics, what excites me about the future of soft tissue mechanics is really a lot of the stuff that Adrian does these days. Sorry, I have to say it. Um, um, Adrian does really, really, really nice work. And I hope you all are going and check it out on data-driven modeling of soft tissue mechanics. And to me, this is, a big element of, I think, the future work that we're going to do. And, and I'm going to let Adrian maybe elaborate on it, but essentially um, it's a machine learning approach toward getting rid of these sort of constitutive models that we've all learned about and really informing simulations and predictive models of soft tissues and specifically skin with raw experimental data. And I think to me, that's, you know, somebody who spends a lot of hours uh, actually, you know, 
doing sort of considerate modeling, fitting, and, and doing all the dark voodoo to make the curves fit the raw data. Uh, to me, this is going to be really an exciting development that we see. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to help Adrian wherever I can with, with his um, really amazing work. Um, but to me, this is something that I get more and more excited about. And uh, I appreciate um, all of Adrian's work that he does in that direction. Oh, wow. Manu, you're so nice. I, I, <laughs> I'm excited about all of skin mechanics work. I think there's so many things that, uh, that we are doing. And then, I mean, this pressure of the project is one uh, project where we're trying to fill in some of the gaps with, for example, aging, which I, I think it's, you know, very, very exciting. Then we're doing more work also with Manu on sort of more uh, scar tissue and thermal treatments for, for scar tissue. I think that's another one that, that is related to skin mechanics that, uh, that, that we're working on and that's also, just the preliminary work that we have been doing on trying to characterize the thermal mechanics of skin has been, yeah, very, very interesting. And it holds promise to, you know, change the way we, we treat some of these conditions um, and improve wound healing. And from the modeling point of view, I am definitely very excited about sort of data, data-driven data modeling and, yeah, trying to get rid of the, the considered models and then sort of see what the, what the data is, uh, is saying. Still trying to impose some of the constraints that we know from physics, but uh, trying to get rid of some of the constraints that come with the choice of a specific uh, model that we that we learned about before someone has developed. Um, so I think yes, I'm, I'm very excited about that specifically from the modeling. But I don't think the the modeling itself has any value if there's no you know complement with good data. So uh, I don't think the data driven modeling aspect would fly at all if there was not good protocols to, to get good data at different scales. So not just mechanical testing, but I'll throw it back to, to Manu, because he, he does multi-scale characterization of, of tissues, which I think is, is really important for the modeling side of things. So not just doing you know, your bi- biaxial test, but do your biaxial test while you put the tissue in, in uh, confocal and try to see the cell distribution, the protein distribution, sort of a really comprehensive characterization of the of the tissues. Yeah, because the the models go as far as the as the data goes. So if there's no not enough of both, then yeah, then the model will just give you useless useless predictions. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Garbage right. in, garbage out, Garb- as they yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've both highlighted that, and I think that really highlights the collaboration between you two, the friendship maybe that exists between mm-hmm. you two, and how everything all works out in the end to make something really impactful and successful. So thank you for sharing all of your experiences, perspectives, and stories, and your friendship with us today on Boom. Absolutely, and maybe if I can say one last sentence in the end, uh, thank you a lot for inviting us. The two of you have done this extremely well. You know, the listeners can't see this, but we got a very, very detailed email <laughs> with all the questions and uh, answers to questions. And I thought it was just very, very professional how you all did this. I uh, just want to compliment you. And, um, you know, what makes me excited about biomechanics is um, talents like you, um, you know, being about to to carry the, the torch and, um, you know, doing just fantastic oh, work thanks. so i'm looking forward to that yeah. i'm very stoked about what y'all are doing the here. listeners don't know either at the end of the questions we sent you there's a bit that says now compliment yeah. Melissa and hannah on- <laughs> so I, thank I you for following the script yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank awesome. you very much for having us here yeah. yeah, we had thank a blast you. thanks Right, we're in research fails mode. Just kidding. We're always in research fails mode. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, we had a research fail very pertinent to this interview in that we were supposed to originally have done this interview about a week ago, but yes. <laughs> a half hour into when we were supposed to have done this interview, I saw it on my calendar. Or no, I didn't see it. I saw an email from yeah, asking Adrian if we were going Manuel. to be doing it. <laughs> Asking where we were. <laughs> yeah, we so. just totally forgot to put on our calendars. And the calendar, if it's not on the calendar, it's not, it's not it's happening, not. <laughs> okay? It's really hard to get on our calendars, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hannah and I have, like, shared calendars to try to organize these. And, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we, I felt 
terrible. Yeah, but they were so nice about it. And as you can see, we had a great interview. Um, yeah, yeah. It was really fun. But Yeah, at the beginning of this interview, Manuel, or Adrian was having a hard time logging on at first. And Manuel was like, oh, what a diva move to show up late to the interview. And I was like, yeah, but like the biggest divas of all <laughs> were the ones that just like didn't show up at all. <laughs> yeah, and we asked so. them in the interview if they had a collaborative research fail because I was actually thinking of this collaborative fail that Melissa and I collaboratively yeah. failed here. It's fun to but. fail with someone, though. So It's true. You feel you a little go. better. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa, do you have any fails to share? Let's see. I guess one thing that's felt like a failure is recruiting people to participate in my study. Like, that's actually very hard to do. And It's the coolest study ever. Well, thank you. I might be biased. I also think it's the coolest (laughs) study ever. But it's hard, you know? Like, it's different, too. It's it's just online, so, like, literally Mm. anyone can do it. But it's... Yeah, it's different than, like, I think there's also, like, an excitement for someone to come into a lab, maybe, oh, and, like, participate yeah. in the study. And But I think we're going to hopefully start offering incentives for people mm. to participating. So beyond just, like, a lottery incentive, also a gift card incentive. So mm. if you uh, – I'm going to just pitch it here. If you want to participate in my study, you can go to sittostand.ai on your phone, and it's about 20 minutes long. And it's a cool biomechanics study, and you can share it with your friends and family. So it's the word sit, the number two, and then the word stand.ai. So please participate. Help me out. Help me graduate. I need <laughs> – I need mean, data. <laughs> but also, you know, in addition to helping Melissa out, it mm-hmm. is going to be the world's largest biomechanics experiment. Yeah. That's, that's how uh, I like to okay, pitch it. Okay, sure. <laughs> so be part Probably of it. You don't want to have missed this train. Yeah, you don't. You want to be able to put that on your resume. Yeah. <laughs> we'll endorse you on LinkedIn. So. <laughs> Exactly. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did. Um, it might be hard because I think we really enjoyed it. but <laughs> Yeah, get on our <laughs> And um, a big, big thank you to the International Society of Biomechanics for their ongoing support. Thank you to Peter Washington for providing music for Boom. And if you'd like to submit a research fail, someone to interview, you'd like to get involved. In fact, we got involved in this interview because uh, Manuel and Adrian reached out to us. Mm-hmm. So email us at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at biomechanicsoom or on Instagram at biomechanicsonourminds. Yeah, or Facebook. And you can or also Facebook. reach out to us that way too and you can also share you know tag us um when you're sharing your cool biomechanics stuff Mm -hmm. and uh we'll be happy to share it and and support all of the cool boom that that you're working on too so uh i'm melissa and i'm hannah biomechanics Biomechanics off our minds. minds